But without further ado, Mr. Paul Connolly. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> that was for you, Shane. I always assume that it is. Um, Paul, thank you very much. Welcome. Thanks very much um, for having me. Great, great to have you. Um, let, let, let's dive straight in. You're mostly, I suppose not mostly, but at the moment, one of the big topics that you've been covering on your programs and one of the big issues in the media mm -hmm. is the issue of the traveling community. Yeah. One of the things that fascinated me looking at you kind of beginning that journey, and I know you've done several programs kind of dealing with that, is what your own sort of feelings or even experiences with travelers were before you began the show. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, sure. I suppose I'll, the remit, the brief for um, the first documentary the town, the travellers took over, um, was just that. It was an idea in TV3. I hadn't had much dealings with the traveller community before that, to be honest. Um, and from what I'd heard of Rathkeel, it was a reasonably um, unfriendly place um, for, for people from the settled community. So I really knew very little before I got there. Um, and there was any number of uh, of rumours, all sorts of speculation, uh, any number of stereotypes about Rathkeel that, I mean, I don't know if many people know about Rathkeel and the travelling community down there, but they're incredibly wealthy. Um, and the rumours are that a vast amount of that wealth comes from um, illicit places, that there's a vast amount of crime down there. Um, so that's pretty much what I went down to investigate to see if that actually was the case. Um, but what I found, of course, was uh, two very different things. Uh, there were splinter groups, there were pockets of people in Rathkeel they were absolutely involved in crime. Um, but then I found a, a very decent community. And there were pockets of the community down there that were extremely poor. And they were very welcoming and very open, very staunch in their traditions, of course. Um, but I suppose in brief, to, to answer your questions, I didn't know an awful lot about the traveler community before I got there. Um, but I found good, bad, um, in equal measure when I did. <clears throat> when you're beginning the process of a program like that, and you said that you didn't have much experience of the traveling community, yeah. you didn't know much about them. How do you gain access? How do you get in? Does saying, I'm Paul Connolly from TV3, does that open a door immediately? Absolutely or not. How do you begin the process? Um, well, it, it's, not very, it's not very scientific, to be honest. I mean, you'll know this as well. All I did was just talk to people. Um, so when, I, when the show was commissioned, um, I had a blank canvas. I had a completely blank page. I had no idea where I was going to go with it. So I spoke to local journalists in Limerick. I spoke to local radio broadcasters in Limerick. I spoke to members of Pavel Point, um, obviously enough, uh, you know, the, the big names in the traveller movement, and just tried to gauge um, what the mood was down there, how welcome I would be. And then I went down myself, went down on St. Patrick's Day, um, because obviously enough, that's a day where I would blend in completely. And I'd heard all sorts of rumours that if you go to Rathke with a camera, that you'd be pelted with stones and all of these types of things. Absolute tosh, nonsense. Didn't happen at all. They were incredibly happy to see me. Um, very welcoming. But in, in terms of the problems that I make, um, I, I try very hard not to just make those documentaries where it's talking heads, people that from, from an absolute uninformed distance will pretend they know about it. So you'll talk to journalists and you'll talk to people who have written books. I was very determined to talk to the travellers um, themselves and to talk to the people that were involved in the crimes, talk to the people that weren't involved in the crimes, talk to the victims. I wanted to try and do that. And I was told um, when I first got there, I walked around all the houses, because again, it's not very scientific. This is how I always do these things. And um, for Dole Sheets, the documentary that I made, I walked around every pub in Dublin and just said, here's my number. If you know anyone that cheats the Dole, give me a ring. And that's where it came from. So I did exactly the same thing down in Rathkeel. I walked around every single one of the houses. I said who I was. I said what I wanted to do. Um, and every one of them said to me, this is never going to happen. Rathkeel travellers are a different type of people. We will never speak to you. We will never speak to the media. Um, but one of them did. And then the second person did. And then the second person, the third did after that. I mean, you, you said that you didn't know much about the travellers. Um, you must have had some, li living in Ireland, oh, you course. must have had yeah, some preconceived yeah. notions. Mm. Yeah. Did you find that those notions were correct, or did you find that they were overturned, mm. or what? It's a, tr it's a tricky one to answer, and I've been asked this uh, quite, a, quite a bit by people. Um, um, because if you ask, and this may be politically incorrect, but ask eight out of ten Irish people what they think of the travellers, and they're not going to be telling you anything good. Um, and it's you know my job and, and, and your job as a journalist to be absolutely impartial, absolutely objective, to leave all of those things at the door when you're going down. My own preconceptions were that I had met good and bad travellers in, e in equal measure. There were travellers in the area that I grew up in. 
Um, some of them were scam artists, but then some of them were just genuinely good people trying to get by and doing so, uh, you know, under the uh, under the umbrella of discrimination. So that's sort of what I went down with. In terms of did they prove to be true? Both of them did. Um, I mean, Rathkeel has. Um, I mean, this fascinated me when I went down there. Rathkeel has one of the most notorious criminal enterprises um, in Western Europe. They're nicknamed the, the, um, the Rathkeel Rovers. They don't call themselves that, and they don't like the title, but that's what other journalists call them. Um, and they trade in, in rhino horns, and they trade in diamonds. Um, they trade in all these different types of things. They go abroad. They do tarmacking jobs. They sell generators. They make millions on the black market and they traffic it back through Europe in various different means. Um, so I went down there to find out if that was true and to find out if pockets of this community were, were bad to the bone, and, and they were, but then there were people that were exceptionally good. There were people that wanted nothing to do with that. Uh, there were people that lived in Rathkeel and they lived under this shadow of suspicion. Um, so it's, but you know, it's no difference between, between them and us. There's, there's rotten people in this room. And there's, good, not. and there's good people in this room. You know, it's the same amongst every single community. It's just the traveller community. It seems to be the two ends of the spectrum seems to be more pronounced. The travellers at the moment, I suppose, are, are getting more media coverage than maybe they ever have before. There's yeah. a whole <clears throat> industry of programmes now about them, you know, with the big fat gypsy weddings mm -hmm. and um, that type of, of, of show. Do you think that in the main that the media exposure has been positive mm. for them or negative? Um, I, th I think it's been negative and I think it's been exploitative, to be honest. And if I'm 100% honest, I was, I was a small part of that. Um, because in, in, uh, if you're working in radio and you're working, working in TV, um, there are certain flashpoints, there are certain triggers that will get ratings. Um, in Ireland, uh, those triggers, uh, surprisingly, sex is not one. I did a documentary series on that, and that fell on its backside, so that's not one. Um, but travellers uh, are very much one. Uh, rural Ireland um, is another. Um, so there are certain triggers. Um, and when this documentary came up, selfishly, I thought to myself, you know, I'm a guy who needs to keep his job. I'm a guy who wants to work in this industry. I will do this, and I will do it in the knowledge um, that I'm part of me is doing it for the ratings. But I am a man of conscience as well. Um, so I did want to, at all points, um, try to be, to be fair. Um, so I suppose in answer to your question, the Big Fat Gypsy Wedding, the traveller community hate that. Mm -hmm. uh, they believe it just paints them and portrays them in the wrongest of lights. And I mean, Channel 4 are clever people. They're only going to pick families who are going to make good TV. And generally, if you're going to make good TV in that type of circumstance, then you're not someone you, you know, you're not the, bright, you're not the brightest spark. <laughs> so, so generally, they're going to exploit people that they would believe would be weak and that they would make good TV out of. Um, so in terms of the umbrella title of Travellers, I think, yes, they have been exploited in television. Uh, I think they've been uh, portrayed horribly. Um, so I set out with the brief of do this because it'll rate well, but try and tell the truth whilst you're doing it. Yeah. You've talked about exploitation, and you've talked about stereotyping, um, and you've talked about, obviously, the need to make television that people are going to be compelled to watch yeah. and keep watching. Do you think that the media has gone some way towards glamorizing certain elements of the criminal underworld? You mentioned yeah. the Rathkeel Rovers there, yeah. and I mean, in that lovely snappy little title you know if we look at various different criminal figures yeah. we see you know names like the penguin and the general and the monk and all these kinds of things mm. um is that something that is that dangerous do you think that that actually in some ways is assisting these people in in, in keeping their jobs mm. in the same way that you want to keep yeah. yours um i think it is dangerous but i also think it's i mean i've thought about this several times it, i think it's dangerous but i think it's the lesser of the evil um, so you will either give men like Fat Freddy Thompson, you will give Christy Kinahan, you will give the Penguin George Mitchell, who are all very famous criminals in Ireland now, you will either give them this notoriety and play to their vanity, or people don't know about them at all. Um, and if people don't know about them at all, well, then I think society is just that bit more vulnerable. Um, the Guardian knowing about themselves, um, the authorities knowing about it just themselves. I don't think that's fair. I think people have have the right, everybody here today, and, and you and I have the right to know who these people are, what they're doing, and also the extent of the damage and the evil um, that they're behind, because these people are unscrupulous, they're malicious. And what I always find fascinating is, well, because I've met not those men, but I've met people very, very like them, 
they are no geniuses. I mean, they are not these sophisticated, um, you know, apex predators sitting at the top of the food chain. That is not who these people are. These are not intelligent people. How do they um, get to the top of the food chain then? Well, I suppose they get there because the people that are working with them aren't that intelligent either. And because crime, you know, it's not that hard. If you want, I mean, anybody here, and I'm certainly not promoting it, but if anybody here wanted to, you know, go and deal in arms or drugs tomorrow, you probably could by Monday, you know. Probably take, it a, probably take you the weekend to get to know the right people, but you probably could. Um, and, you know, to try and stay out of the gaze of the Gardaí, I mean, they're hugely unresourced. And so it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's not that difficult. Some of them are clever now, but what I'm trying to say um, is that they love the media attention. They love that I mention them in the documentaries. They love that they were on the front cover of the Evening Herald and, uh, you know, in the Irish Times. They have a huge vanity which fuels their massive sociopathic egos. Um, and that's, I think, so I think it's the lesser of the evils, um, but I think they play up to it as well. You, you've talked about these guys, um, and one of the things that you haven't <coughs> mentioned is the... I suppose, the physical risk that goes along with being involved in that world. Yeah. I mean, you were talking over lunch about an individual that you met recently who was uh, involved in a very ag aggressive part of the industry. Do you mm. want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, I, was, I was mentioning over, we were eating ice cream, and I was talking, <laughs> I was talking about serial killers. Um, we, I, uh, as you do. <laughs> as you do. Um, I'm, I'm making a documentary at the moment, and the working title is dreadful, but this is it. It's called Ireland Armed and Dangerous. But it's, it's about something deeper and more substantial. It's about the weapons-carrying culture in Ireland yeah. and the emerging one. Um, and I speak to people who have shot and killed people. I speak to people who have been shot. I speak to people who have been stabbed. I speak to people who throw pipe bombs, all these kinds of things. And, and, uh, and recently met um, a hitman um, that works and operates out, out of Dublin. Um, and what my friends particularly get a kick out of is that the only place I've ever been tough in my life is on the football field. Um, <laughs> because I, I love football and I'm a maniac. I've got athletic Tourette's. I can't stop shouting at people when I play football. Um, <laughs> but uh, but if, if someone's, I mean, if someone, um, uh, if, if, if there's a row in a pub, I'm not the boy involved, you know, if there's, someone throwing shapes at me. I've never been that guy, but the only way that I can explain it is that my, my curiosity overpowers um, my fear. Um, I've always been fascinated as to what makes these people tick. And even sitting there with that guy uh, last week, and he kills people for a living, and the reason why he got into it, and I, I know, it sounds ridiculous, you imagine that's his, what he did. imagine his CV? <laughs> <laughs> Very impressive, exactly. So what attracted you to the work? Um, he, uh, but you know, even, even sitting there, um, uh, talking to him, I mean, sure, myself and the cameraman were a little bit concerned, and, and for legal reasons more than anything else, we had to bring security. So it was quite funny, actually. He's a big, burly guy, about six, six, six and a half foot tall, massive, bald head. We had to pretend he was a sound man. So he was holding the thing because we didn't want to spook the hit. Friendlingly, I Absolutely. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, but no, um, I mean, there are some situations where, it's, where it is dangerous. I mean, you, you mean, you're sitting there with someone who kills people for a living. So there are very obvious dangers, despite the fact that I might be quite naive and think that the title of journalist protects me more than it actually does. Uh, but yeah, I get scared. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think history has proven that the title of journalist doesn't protect yeah, you. No. I mean, just purely out of curiosity, I mean, this, this, this guy that you met who, as you say, kills people for a yeah. living. I mean, to look at him, would you have any oh, idea no. at all? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Now, this guy in particular... And this happens quite a lot these days, and I find it fascinating. Um, he was um, a drug addict. He was a heroin addict. And basically, when he ran out of money, because uh, as anybody who has any relations or family members in addiction will know that um, they have to find the money from somewhere. Um, and the further you get into addiction, the less likely you are to be in employment. So, um, you know, it gets very tricky. So he was getting drugs off this guy on the slate, as in he was getting them on credit. But that's a very clever way of manipulating people insofar as they get you to a certain level of debt. They know you can't pay. You owe your soul to the company store. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But we'll wipe this debt if you knock this fella off. Um, and life is incredibly cheap in the drugs industry, in, in, you know, in, in underground Ireland. It absolutely is. So, so that's how he started. Um, and he's continued ever since. He doesn't do drugs anymore. He's completely clean when I met him. Uh, he was well presented, slick back hair, shiny shoes. Uh, suit, you would not set this fella apart from anybody. He was cold, calculating, but if I'm honest, he was quite funny. He was quite charismatic, and he was very interesting. At this point, he was well-traveled. Um, 
I'm, I'm, but I mean, I'm not lying to you. I mean, we were all sitting there at one point forgetting who he was, thinking he was charming. What a, what a dream boat, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was bizarre. But that's one thing I really found um, with all of these people that I've met over the course of the work that I've done, um, be they drug traffickers, be they hit men, um, be they pimps, um, is that some of them can be, can be very intelligent, some of them can be, and I'm contradicting what I said earlier, but these are the exceptions to the rule. Some of them can be very intelligent, charismatic, interesting, well-traveled people, but what they lack, and it's common in all of them, is, is empathy. That's the one thing they just don't have. So when I'm sitting there as a journalist going, how can you do this? It, it almost perplexes them, as in, how can you not? It's easy. I get money, um, the money you make in, in two months in a day. You know, so it's empathy that it amazes me. It's really interesting. I mean, you know, we were talking about uh, earlier today as well about you know, people that you meet who are genuinely bad, yeah. you know, and <clears throat> why people become like that. I mean, with some of the classes that are... Are, are, are here, you know, we've been doing in class, um, you know, about attachment, you know, people bonding with their mothers yeah. and parents when they're very, very young. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd wonder, it's very, sometimes it's hard to think of someone like a hitman, yeah. that he was a baby once, who maybe didn't have a good relationship with his parents. And is that yeah. something that leads you on that path to first addiction and then to whatever? I mean, it's, yeah. it, it's interesting, isn't it, when you start filling in the gaps in the picture? Mm as to what it is. I mean, did, did he talk about that at all? He did, you know, because I like to try and go into it just a little bit to see where, where they're coming from, their reasons for doing it. It's very difficult to put it into, uh, to kind of crowbar all of that into an hour-long documentary, but that is a part that fascinates me, what drives people to do these kind of things. And, and it really frustrates me, although it's an oversimplification that's everywhere in the media, you will see, you know, um, I mean, even a fairly controversial example, but Larry Murphy, the beast of Bolton glass, and um, you will see anybody who's murdered anyone, anybody who's raped anybody, anybody who's stabbed anyone, portrayed as, as absolute horrific, inhuman monsters. And what they've done is inhuman. What they've done is horrific. Um, but if you actually just leaf back through their lives, almost in every single occasion that I've come across, um, there were issues in their formative years that sort of directed them towards that, whatever empathy they were born with, whatever feeling, whatever sympathy, whatever humanity that there was there, it, you know, had been extinguished by some horrific event or by, you know, a string of horrific events. Um, but there was, and I know I mentioned this earlier on, which I thought was interesting too, I've argued with people that it's, that it's always the environment. It's never just hardwired into someone's DNA. But I was speaking with, um, some of you may know his name, um, Jerry O'Carroll, he's a detective. Um, and he would have been very heavily involved. He's retired now, but he was involved in the Martin Cal case, and he was the one that found Veronica Gear and yeah, He's ship. often on TV discussing often on TV, these. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's very experienced. Yeah, he's very experienced, and he's dealt with these kind of people all his life. Um, and I said to him, have you ever met anyone that was just cold to the bone? And he said, yeah, he said, John Gilligan, who was the man, of course, that, that, um, that sanctioned the Veronica Gear and killing. Um, he said there was just something about that man that you could tell there was no humanity, whatever was, just was never there. Um, and uh, so I think it's the exception to the rule. I think generally the people that I come across, there's something in them, that, there's heart there, um, but they've lost touch with it, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, c continuing on that theme, um, one of the first TV shows of yours <coughs> that I ever saw was one <laughs> in which you went with a couple of Irish sex tourists to yeah. various locations, mm -hmm. one of which I think was Prague. Prague and Hamburg, um, yeah. And I was really interested watching that. There was one particular scene where one of the gentlemen that you traveled with uh, went into a um, brothel, for want mm -hmm. of a better word. Yeah. And um, I mean, you followed him a certain part of the way, I think into the bar, basically, and chatted to him while he had his drinks. And he chose from effectively the menu who yeah. he wanted to head off with. And then you left him as he went off to do whatever it was he was going to do. <clears throat> and I remember thinking, for somebody like yourself, and I mean, I knew you at that stage. Yeah. We'd, 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 actually, our roles had been reversed when we met first. You were interviewing me. But um, I remember thinking that must have been tough for you. What I knew of you, I knew it must have been tough for you to actually turn away at that point because mm. this guy was effectively doing something which in, in our part of the world is criminal. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's an awful, that, that, that environment that you were in, mm. for many people would be quite difficult to even just be there. How do you remain objective in a situation like that? Um, with great difficulty sometimes, if I'm honest, because, because I, have, I have two sisters, I've got a niece, um, you know, so to see the, the girls that we came across um, over in Prague and over in Hamburg, 
it was it, it was very very difficult to, just to sit back but i suppose that the, the mentality of the two guys that i was with and anybody that didn't see it it's exactly what shane said i just traveled with two men um, one to Prague, one to Hamburg, and tried to understand why they went to brothels, why they slept with these women, why they went to strip shows, what they got out of it, and then how they felt about it afterwards. So I think you have to look more so, my objecti- more so than my objectivity as to why the lads were doing it in the first place. And oddly, the hitman and the guy who sleeps with prostitutes are, are quite similar. It's as far as they just don't have that empathy. They just don't have that compassion. Yeah. They are absolutely disconnected from whatever area of feeling and um, that is, I mean, I interviewed them extensively both before and after the program and, and on camera saying, what is it about this that you, that you like? What is it about this sort of what some people would describe as a very empty, hollow, lonely experience? Having sex with a woman that very likely was driven to do this through um, circumstances that, you know, she didn't, she wasn't proud of or that couldn't prevent, um, you know, really what drove you to do that kind of thing. And in every single case, they just didn't seem to understand that the woman themselves may not want to do it. They were of the belief that every prostitute that smiles at you, every stripper that smiles at you is doing so because they're genuinely happy. Not because for the vast majority of them, or at least in my experience, they're, you know, burning with sadness. You know, they're just destroyed inside knowing that they have to sell themselves as a pound of flesh to men like them, you know. So um, knowing that was going on was very difficult, but I separated myself because I understood that they just didn't possess the ability to understand it. Um, I'm not saying they were simple men. I'm just saying that um, that compassion that I would have, that you would have, and that I imagine a lot of people in the audience would have for the women in those places, they just didn't have it. Mm. Um, so I understood why they were doing it. I certainly didn't, did, not that I, it's my place to approve. Um, I understood it. I just didn't like it. Do you see your job, or do you see the part of your job is coming down on one side or the other in terms of the morality of a situation. Mm. I remember an editor saying to me some time ago, you know, our job is to simply observe and let the consumer, the reader or the viewer or whatever, decide yeah. what they think. Do you find yourself in your programs, because I know you were telling me you're kind of in, in the process of editing, yeah. you know, yeah. and I mean, do you find when you're editing that you want to come down one way or the other, or do you try to take a step back from that? I try, I try to take a step back because I think it's very much our responsibility to be objective and impartial, but if I'm, you know, it's absolute rubbish to think that I could make my way through a whole program and even not subconsciously have some kind of a moralistic bent on it. I'm sure I do. I mean, I made a documentary. I mean, you can see it in my face. I've got a very expressive face, and I get disgusted at the, you know, the smallest of things. I remember, you know, I said to my friends and family before I made Dole Cheeks, it was the first documentary I did in TV3, and I said, no, no, I said, look, I stood back, completely impartial. I did not judge these people. And then three minutes into it, I had my face skewed up in disgust at this guy going, really, you use my money to buy a house in Turkey for yourself. Are you proud of yourself? You know, that's not really impartial at all, you know? So, um, but I think people like that. I think that there are certain uh, people that want to get into journalism, into media, and I was very sort of, um, t- very stoic and observing these principles at the start, that you need to take a step back. But at the same time, you have to be human. You know, I'm just a guy like anyone else, and things disgust me, and I like things. And I found in documentaries these days, um, it's, it's taking a curve towards no, no longer talking at an audience. It's talking to them. And so it's, you know, this is how I honestly feel. This is what honestly happened. I went to meet this guy. He didn't turn up. That's what actually happened. So it's nice to let people in on who you are. It's nice to let them in on the evolution of the story. And then it's nice to let them know that you feel the same things that they feel. I think if you expect an audience to appreciate you, you have to give them something of yourself. I mean, you've touched on such such sort of sensitive, and, and I must admit there's been times when I see a, title for one of your programs coming up, I kind of think, oh, how, how is he going to handle this? You oh, know, yeah. like the, the one that particularly struck me was the, the, the bogus beggars. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Mm. I have to, I'm somebody who generally, when I walk past somebody who's begging, will feel, if I've got any change in my pocket at all, inclined yeah. to kind of Throw it over. T- toss a few, a few pence, whatever I have in. Do you mm. know what I mean? And I tend to always work on the assumption that it's genuine. Mm. Um, how, I mean, that, that particular program, I mean, just for people that didn't see it, just explain mm. kind of what you, what you learned. Sure, so um, I, don't, I don't know if the Roma are in Waterford, are they? Um, um, yes, yeah, sometimes. Okay, yeah. so the, Ro- the Roma community, which are distinct from, from, from Romanian people, um, are, are a small ethnic minority um, that uh, I think 
came from, um, originally came from, um, I'm not sure actually, I think it was Africa at some point. Anyway, so they've spread all across Europe. Their base is in Romania, and they're basically gypsies. There are, there are parallels between the Roma community um, and Ireland's traveler community, except that it is very much part of the Roma tradition uh, to beg. So they fan out all across Europe, um, and that's pretty much how they made their profession. One, because that's what they know, and second, because very few people will actually employ them, although a lot of people actually do try. Um, so the documentary started off, I got an awful lot of grief for this documentary. I bet you did. Oh, yeah. I really did. And I made a mess of some parts of it, if I'm absolutely honest. Um, but I started off with the brief, in my own naivety, of I wanted to know if this was true. Because I used to do a, a radio show on 98 FM in Dublin. And any time, this was a real trigger point, any time you mentioned the Roma, people rung up and go, they're scumbags, they're disgusting, they're ripping us off. Um, all they do is funnel money to kingpins in Romania to fuel the building of mansions for themselves. And when they get to a certain point, they all move back into these palatial homes. So I started off with that. This was the basis of it. So in my piece to camera at the start, I said, I want to find out if this is speculation or if it's true. So we did. Um, and we set up CCTV cameras in the spots they beg. We set up CCTV cameras outside their houses. Um, we basically surveilled and watched these people for three months. And at the end of it, I, I came across the biggest editorial dilemma I have ever come across in my entire life. Because part of me, um, and this is when I, is my second program for TV3, so I was dying to get a story. You know, I really was. I wanted ratings. I wanted another contract. I mean, these are all things boiled in the background. And after three months, I had nothing. <laughs> I really had nothing. These people were not rich, and they were not fun funneling money back. Um, I had private detectives working in the background. I had someone working for me in, um, well, I can't really say where that is, but anyway, I knew where their finances were going. Um, and they were penniless. They were on welfare for those of whom were, were literate and could actually fill in the forms. So I had this huge moral dilemma when I got to the end of that. Right, and I'll be honest, do I make this up? Do I talk? rubbish and actually create a story here and um, which I know a lot of journalists do when it comes to the Roma or do I tell the truth and if I'm 100% honest there were thousands of editorial meetings where the truth actually came was at my dinner table with my parents and I said to dad my dad I said dad look I'm screwed this is the end of me and he said it's a story he said that that you can't find anything that the stereotype is completely untrue that that's the story so so that's what it did. Isn't it interesting, you know, that the big drama that everybody expected wasn't actually there Ooh, in yeah. the first place. Sometimes the news is that there isn't any news. Yeah. What you appear or what appears is, is what's there. Mm. The media is changing a lot at the moment. I mean, I'm thinking particularly around issues like, um, you know, the whole, um, you know, Lord McAlpine thing, sure. the, the, the Jimmy Savile case and the, how social networking and that are becoming such a, a big part of everybody's life. Sure. And yet that's going to change as well because, I mean, that, that particular case, he's suing the average Twitter thousands user. Thousands of people, you know, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. thousands yeah. of people. I mean, do, do you, is, is social networking something that you would use at all in terms of your research or how do you see it as playing a part in the type of journalism that you do? Yeah, it's, tr it's tricky to be honest. Um, in the type of journalism that I do well, for instance, um, uh, in, in TV3 now, social media has been very much incorporated into the way we do our jobs. Um, so, for instance, say you're working in Ireland AM or, or Midday or something like that, and you're looking for a guest, or even Vincent Brown, we do what's called a scattergun approach. So if we don't have this person's number, um, we will get their number, we will uh, get their email address, we will find them on Twitter, we will find them on Facebook, we'll find them everywhere else they are, and we scattergun them. So for that reason, it's very, very useful. Um, and in terms of uh, how I would use Facebook for my programs, occasionally there are support groups, victim groups, those type of things. I will always tap into them, find the people behind them, and, and do that. Um, but other than that, I, I don't really tend to use them an awful lot. And, and uh, when I started off in, in journalism um, and started off working in television, I wasn't 100% sure of the reasons I was doing it. I thought some of it might have been vanity. I thought some of it might have been, I'm dying to get on the box. You know, this, this is going to be terrific. But what I found is more and more, I actually shy away from that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to be at launches. I don't want to be at opening. Um, Glenda Gilson is very pretty, but I don't want to be standing beside her at a function. Um, you know, She's probably taller than She is much taller. It's quite embarrassing, to be mm -hmm. honest. Yeah, there's, there's no... There's, <laughs> I wouldn't really volunteer for that. Um, and, and generally, um, so what I'm trying to say is I wouldn't be building up a Facebook or Twitter following, if mm. you know what I mean. I have no real interest in, in doing that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I mean, it's, it's coming under fire as well in terms of things like sort of the, the whole sort of cyber bullying thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, we've had all these stories in the media lately. 
Mm. And I mean, I was thinking about that, that the other day. I mean, a lot of what you do is about how people treat one another. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Or whether people are nice to one another, whether mm -hmm. they're not, how we treat various different demographics. Um, do you think that that sort of upsurge of something like cyberbullying is in some ways being encouraged by how the media presents human interaction? Oh, yeah. Reality TV, a lot of the time, yeah. is about people not being terribly nice yeah. to one another. I know what you mean. I was actually talking to, to someone about this the other day, and I was sitting in the car, and I think I was grumpy, and the news was on, and it was seven different murders in seven parts of the world, and I was just thinking, you know, why are we hearing so much about this? And I know it's horrific, but I thought it was invasive to the people that it happened to, to their families. I wasn't 100% sure um, that I really wanted to hear it, and I suppose it got onto the nature of news, and the nature of news is to exploit and report on the very worst part of society, um, and that's what it is. So you pick up a newspaper today and you will see all they will feature, except for the odd, you know, the side column, are everything that's bad about people. Uh, you watch any bit of reality television, as I said to you earlier on, mm. about the gypsies and the gypsy weddings. They very deliberately handpick families that they know will either be incredibly controversial, will be strongly disliked, or will have Neanderthal-like um, views and opinions on things. I mean, they're not stupid. So. People that make programs try to focus, and people that write headlines, and people, you know, and these cyber bullies, you know, they, they will always hone in on the very worst parts um, of the society, you know, of people. So, I mean, if that's what people are reading, that's what people are seeing, and that's what's being digested, it's no surprise to me that they're regurgitating it in the most horrible of ways. An awful lot of what you do as well links into social class and poverty. Mm. I mean, a lot of the time you're dealing with people that are living, you know, very much on the breadline of society. And yeah. as we know, that can lead to, you know, things like addiction and, and, and violence and all of those issues. Um, do you think that the economic recession and the times that we're living in now has in some ways kind of created a new level of those kinds of problems within our culture? So do you mean socioeconomic problems or yeah. crime? Or socioeconomic problems which then feed into the likes of crime and stuff like well, that. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's now, and I suppose it's a slightly unscrupulous way of looking at things, um, it's now far easier for me to find someone, because Ireland's very small. Um, so you're dealing with, uh, for people like me that are trying to make investigative programs, you're trying to exploit things and you're trying to highlight things that people don't want to talk about. So it's very difficult to find people, but I've found that in the past year, it's been far easier. Um, because people are of the opinion that you will pay them to talk to them. Uh, so you will find drug addicts, you will find arms dealers, you will find um, you know, people in all areas of crime coming forward, whereas they previously would not have. And these aren't the big guns. These are the street dealers and you know, the people at the lower level, the foot soldiers of all of these type of things. Um, so yeah, absolutely. In terms of, uh, of, of, of the, the criminal classes, I, I can see even within those people. Um, that money is, 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 is incredibly tight, but I think anybody could tell you that um, since the recession hit, the, the landscape of the country is, has absolutely changed. So um, more stratas than ever before to, to, the, to the socioeconomic classes. I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's middle, there's poor, there's poorer, uh, you know, so. You deal with pretty unpleasant issues on kind of a, a, a daily basis. Um, how do you walk away from that in the evening and oh, kind yeah. of get back to just normal stuff? You know, do you find that this stuff lives on in your head mm. a long time after it? Yeah, it does. Um, and I find it especially difficult because to get good from the programs that I make, you have to deal with very bad people. So very often the sources, like for instance, the fellow, and I don't know if anybody saw the town the travelers took over, there was a, a guy that, it was sort of the main source. There was two. There was a traveler insider, a guy who had worked with travelers for years, and then there was um, a traveler himself. So these were the two men giving me information, and it, they were very credible witnesses, and you always have to check your sources, make sure there were no agendas there, and all of that was done. Um, but the guy, the insider, was, he was just, he was bad to the bone. He really was. And um, the things he could do to people, and the things he had done to people, and just his, his, just his very being and his essence. There was, I just didn't like being around him. And I felt, I found um, that him more so than anyone, I could spend two hours in his company and spend two days in Blackness. You know, and I'm not exaggerating it. Like yeah. People, 
my friends would say to me, my family would say to me, it was just incredibly hard to shake off. So I think it's, it's, it's naive for anybody in this kind of business to think that you can walk into this and you can spend time with these kind of people and it's not going to rub off on you because it absolutely does. And it also changes your mindset and changes your worldview hugely. I mean, you're, you're seeing the, the things that people who are essentially in some ways evil um, are capable of. I'm sure I live. Previously to that, I lived in a bubble like most people do, you know, and um, middle class family, never come across these people, read about them in the newspapers, just like everyone else. And um, so I'm now far, my eyes are um, far more, my mind is more open to the possibilities. So, I'm, you know, I'm, I find myself being scared more often now mm. um, than I would have been before because I know what people are capable of. Um, and I also find that it rubs off on me hugely, yeah. And have you ever felt particularly threatened or unsafe? Um, I've spoken to some of these guys. Yeah, no, very, very much so. Um, I made a documentary last year called Ireland's Vice Girls, um, and we it was about prostitution, um, and it looked into uh, people in the business, the so prostitutes, pimps, the websites that set it up, um, and then the punters themselves. Um, and there was one fella that we interviewed, and I knew straight away that there was just something off with him. He was a pimp. He ran a, uh, he ran a business on the streets. He was trafficking women in and out of Eastern Europe. He was telling them they were coming over here to clean houses. And then basically when they got there, he put them in what's called debt bondage. Um, so he said, right, you can get out if you want, but you owe me 5,000 euro before you can even think about it. So they were forced immediately into prostitution. He would then lead them into addiction. So he was just, he was a bad fella. You know, he really was not a good mm. guy. And after the interview, because I promised him anonymity, um, and after the interview, I would continuously get phone calls in the middle of the night from private numbers but from him saying, if anybody sees my face, your whole family will be done. Um, you know, just, which is horrific. And then that really made me question, you doing this at all, you know? Yeah. I mean, how much do you want to do something like this? And I interviewed, actually, I would have been speaking to you at the same time, mm. I interviewed Donald McIntyre, where everyone will know is I sort know, of at the yeah. top of the food chain and yeah. when it comes to my kind of work. And, Things he does, I would never do if I'm 100% honest, but I asked him a question in the interview. I said, is there any quality of life in leading a double life? Because he would be undercover. Yeah. And he said, no, there's nothing good about it. He said, people get great TV, stories are exploited. The overall good is served, but you know, you're left to pick up the pieces. And you know, I really started at that time to think, I'll, I'll be in constant danger. I'll be looking over my shoulder. Do I really want this? Um, but I did, it continued. And then the same thing happened with the travelers from Rathkeel. Once the documentary was aired, phone calls at all time of the night, morning and night. Um, but it's just, it's, it's part, of the, part of the job. And then it goes back in to what I said earlier on, just the, the, the curiosity overpowers the fear. <laughs> um, when, when we met first, you were working on radio yeah. in Dublin. Um, it, for, for our students that are involved in, in, in um, sort of studying the media, uh, what, what's the different sort of skill set that you need between radio and TV? What's the, and how does, how does working in that area differ? Um, I, I think they all lead into each other, actually. I started off, um, I started off with a very set idea. This is very typical me. I'll always start with something and you know, try and see it through to the end, no matter who suffers in the way. Um, and I was of the impression that you needed to be a good writer before you could be a good broadcaster. Um, you needed to be able to write copy. You needed to be very succinct in what you say. Well, it helps. It does, very much so. So, uh, so I started off working in print, did that, worked in a publishing house, worked for several magazines, a couple of newspapers, and I felt I'd done what I could do there. Um, then I went on to work in radio, um, where you really learn your craft. I think anybody that's, that, that's going to go into media needs to go into radio. And the reason why you need to do it isn't because you're going to be fantastic and articulate and you're going to get a huge audience. It's because you're going to make the biggest cock-ups of your life. Um, and that's where you learn. Uh, because until you are on air with 60,000, 100,000 people listening, um, you can't hear your producer, your computer has crashed, you've no script in front of you, and you can't hit the button because it's broken, you can't go to an ad break. Until that happens, then you are not a broadcaster. Until you can get out of a situation like that, then you're nothing. Um, and I think that's what really made me, um, because there were so many situations like that, um, that that just prepares you for what often can and absolutely does go wrong. Because if you can leave the script to one side, if you can just believe that you're good enough to be there, and if you can believe that people don't want someone um, talking to them, talking at them, they want to be talked to. So if you're just yourself um, and you can get through a situation like that, I think 
and that's a wonderful thing. So in terms yeah. of the difference of TV and radio, I think you need to learn how to write, learn and make your mistakes in radio, and then go into TV. I think that's the sort of difference. That's for that's me, anyway. Path, anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, what's it like being famous? I'm not famous. Yes, you are. I am not yes, famous. Yes, you are. People occasionally, <laughs> people occasionally recognize me, but I certainly wouldn't, be, wouldn't think I'm famous. It must have changed your life, though. I mean, you're on TV however many hours yeah, yeah, yeah. a week, you know? Yeah. People do watch your shows, Very much, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, so they great. know who you are. So, I mean, how has it altered your, your life experience? Um, very little. Irish people are, 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 don't really approach you. I, I, I often see people nudging their girlfriends and going, isn't that your man that was chasing knackers through Europe? You know, I, I, <laughs> I often see that. Um, but I don't, I don't really, people don't come up to me, you know? Yeah. Occasionally, if you're in a pub, uh, and then, you know, a few, few pints of them, they go, go, I liked your thing, or I didn't like your thing, or stuff like that. But that hasn't changed my life at all, if I'm honest. Really? No, really, it genuinely hasn't. I mean, I'm, I, mean I, I really like doing things like, like today. Um, um, and that's the only difference is that more opportunities come your way. You know that way? Like, um, I can ring people now that I would, th I would think would never know who I am. Um, and I would be nervous as hell ringing them. And they go, oh, I saw your thing. I really liked it. You know, that kind of stuff. So that's new. It's opening doors. Yeah. 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 But that's it. Um, you've, as you said, you've done your print media. Yeah. You've, you know, had a successful radio program. Yeah. You're a, a known television face. I mean, what ambitions are there left for you? I mean, where, where do you want to go Ooh. next? Um, where do I want to go next? There's a big question insofar as investigative journalism, do you want to get typecast? Because you get very typecast very quickly in this very narrow pocket, this very narrow pigeonhole. So um, I really like what I'm doing for the moment, but I don't know if I want to continue doing it forever. Um, but I suppose my, my ambitions are to do this um, to bigger audiences. Um, I mean, I absolutely love working for TV3. I intend to work for TV3 for a very long time. Um, but if the BBCs of the world came knocking on the door, if Panorama wanted me in the morning, um, then I'd, I'd love to talk to them. I've always had this sort of... And I think if I am successful, um, and I think if I am, um, have done well, if people will recognise me in the street, I think it's, it's, it's a couple of things that I've only realised quite recently. And it's by comparing myself to people that I've worked with in radio and in TV, and that um, really determined, and I've surprised myself in that, mm. in that... Um, I, I will never let something go to air unless I know that it's as good as it can absolutely be. Um, I will never pass up on something if I think it would make a program um, that little bit better. Um, I have really high standards, I expect. Um, really high standards of other people. And if I fall out with people in work, which I very often do, that's why. Because I, I can't stand the words, uh, it'll be grand. I can't stand the words, or it'll do. It drives me insane. Unless someone says, that's as good as it can be. Um, well, then I will never put my name to it. Um, and I've always been very rigid in that. So, so I think if I do go anywhere, um, if I go to the BBC's of the world, if, or if I go to, you know, to the US and you know, work for any of the big cable networks over there, which would be an ambition of mine, um, then I think that's what will get me there. So you're a perfectionist, basically, is what you're saying. Sort of. Sort mm. of, yeah. yeah, Pain in the arse as well. But like, <laughs> yeah, sort of. Sort of. What, what do you do when you're not working? Um, as I said earlier on, I, I tap into my athletic Tourette's in the football field. I'm uh, a huge footballer, always have been, um, love soccer. I have uh, a, a soccer team, an 11 assault soccer team, which I manage called the Golden Years, um, which is a bunch of 35-year-old lads which throw themselves around a pitch on a Wednesday night. Um, it's good crack, it's good crack. <laughs> we won the league, get up the Golden Years. Um, and, uh, um, I, I, I read a lot. I can't pretend to read good books, and I fall asleep after five pages every night. Um, but you That's know, allowed. Yeah, the, but the general thing is work. The thing about anybody who's getting into media and into TV, and you'll know this as well, um, you have to be prepared for it to completely consume your life, um, especially if you're the producer, because the, the programs do take on the form of your children, and you want to see your children develop well, and you want to see them when they're actually put in front of a public audience. You want to see them... Uh, reflect and look upon well. So uh, I have a horrible problem with not being able to detach from work. Um, and I try to pretend I'm in great form, but my girlfriend sees through it straight away. You know, she knows I'm thinking about part three, that, yeah. that bit of VO that I couldn't quite work out before I left. Um, so whilst I do all the normal things, and I have a great set of friends, and I have a terrific family, um, and I, you know, I love my few pints, and I love travel and all that kind of stuff, 11 and a half months of the year, it's about work. <laughs> 
if I'm honest. <laughs> well, it's good, good to have a passion. Yes. Isn't it? Isn't you know, it? Good, to, good to like, like yeah. doing what you're being paid to do. Yeah. Okay, we've got some questions from the audience. I'm just going to blow my nose. Sorry. Oh, you sniffly, blow, you blow sniffly, away sorry. while I find um, <laughs> the questioners. Um, who's got a question? I'm peering out here at the, where's Kai? Hi, Kai. Can we, do we have a mic up the top there? I can hear you. Okay, Kai, shoot. Good question. Um, I, 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 to be honest, I don't see it being very different than it is at the moment. In fact, I see, uh, where are you, Kai? He's up, up the top up there. there. <laughs> Kai? <laughs> How are you? Um, I, don't, I don't really see it being very, very different than it is at the moment. Um, one of the really interesting things that I found when I was looking into the traveller community, and I'm only speaking from my own opinion here now, which is important, um, is that there is, for all the discrimination and animosity and vitriol that's directed towards uh, the traveller community from the settled community, it works exactly the opposite way. Uh, so the traveller community, or at least the people I came across, um, have stereotypes, have preconceived notions, have these horrible perceptions of the settled community that very often have absolutely no basis in truth as well. So I think until some absolute genius works out a way um, of getting the two communities to understand that they're both exactly the same, and that there's good and bad in both community, and that they're both trying to work towards the same thing, which is love and be loved, make a few quid, have a happy home, um, I think it's going to continue on um, for 25 years and, and, and further than that. I mean, I looked into, I really thought about why the traveler community are like they are. And I think their, their traditions and their approach to life, I, I almost think it was born out of a discrimination directed at them from the settled community. And it's born out of that hatred. So whilst they are very distinct in their traditions and they're very unique, I think a lot of traveler tradition, and again, it's just my opinion, is born out of wanting to do the exact opposite to the settled community. So um, I think, you know, um, the two are, it's like the Big Bang. The two started at the beginning and they're moving exponentially away from each other. And until someone works out how to get them back together, I, I can't see it working out. I think the, the main, well, I got the microphone. Uh, oh, I, I think thought. the main problem was uh, Shane was telling us in class that as the government brings more and more laws in that yeah. pretty much discriminate against the travelers, that they can't carry out their lifestyle. Yeah. You know, more and more are forced to settle. You know, they, they can't do what they want. That's that's wh where I was going, you know, 25 years. Like, oh, I see what you mean. Okay, so, you, so you're saying that the, if the laws continue to be made, well, then will it just get worse and worse? Um, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure what those laws are. The 2001 Trespass Act was oh. the main one which prevented a lot of the traditional halting sites oh, from being used. Oh, I get you. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that has really, if you remember, there was actually a constitutional... Um, query made by um, President Attlee yeah. you know, that came around to see whether it was actually constitutional. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like there has been a, a vendetta going back to the, almost like the 1960s. It's horrific. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know? I mean, the, the more, I mean, it's, 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 it's wrong in so many ways, isn't it, that the settled community and the government are trying to, um, are trying to funnel and crowbar the traveller community into our very narrow definitions of normal. You know, what we think is normal has nothing to do with what they think is normal, and we're, you know, it might sound, sound a bit rehearsed and, and, and liberal and left-wing, but, like, let them be who they are. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it is our business in the far as we have to live with them, and if their lifestyle encroaches unreasonably on ours, then absolutely things need to be done, um, but we, they should be respected for who they are and what, who they want to be as well. You know. That's great. Thanks a million, Kai. Is Agla up there as well? Okay. Um, Shoot. Um, just wanted to ask, what would your next big topic be? What, sure. what next would you like to explore? What I'd like to explore next? Um, well, I think we're actually going back to, would you believe we're doing more traveler uh, stuff? Um, and I know I said I was exploit, exploited them earlier on, um, and I wanted it for rating. But it, it's interesting this time, because we touched on, um, in the second part of the recent series, which was following the traveler's secret millions, the sensationally titled, um, episode uh, where we touched on the travelers in America. I didn't know anything about this, that the largest traveler population outside of Ireland um, is in America. Um, and that whilst they stay very true to the Irish traditions and the traveler traditions, they've, they've, they're also completely their own, um, not species, but they're their own ethnic minority, ethnic group, as far as they just, their traditions even over there have, uh, have changed hugely and they're, they're hugely unique. And um, so we're going over there and um, spend time with them. It isn't me chasing them around 
uh, trying to prove that they're scamming people, but it's me going over to spend time with them to actually understand who they are, uh, what they've borrowed and brought with them from Ireland, um, and then how that tradition has evolved. Um, so we're doing that, and then there's two I'm working on at the moment, which are nearly finished, please God, before Christmas. Um, <laughs> one of them is called, as I said, the Armed and Dangerous, which is about the weapons carrying culture. Um, people that you know deal in guns, knives, carry guns and knives, and then people that use them. And then drug trafficking from the source to the streets. Uh, so basically we start off wherever the drug's from, from say it's cocaine from South America, and then basically the entire process the whole way through, how it gets here, who picks it up, who distributes it, who takes it, and, and then basically who, who suffers in the end. So. Well, they do, absolutely. We went over to Warsaw in Poland, um, where we found them working in a very salubrious part of the town altogether. It was a uh, very, very upper-class place. They'd gone to several houses. These people obviously had a good few quid, um, and they had no trouble finding work. And when I say work, is in laying tarmac. And the tradition amongst these particular crews is that they lay an inch of tarmac. They put sand over it. They get the money up front. They say they'll be back tomorrow. And, you know, then they're in some other Eastern European country by the time the sun's up, you know, that way. So absolutely, but what they do, and it's, but they're very clever in the way they do it. They will, they, I mean, the Irish name and the Irish traditions and our sense of fun and all that kind of stuff travels really well, um, and they just ride that wave. They ham it up, they do the plastic paddy thing, um, and people fall for it all over the world. They don't know that they're, that they're travelers. They don't know that they have a reputation for this kind of thing. Um, but then occasionally, I did come across people, and it was nearly another non-story, I came across people that did really good work. We got to a few places over in Warsaw, and it was impeccable. Um, and we brought an expert with us, and you know, he said, that's as fine a job as I've ever seen. So, you know, you, it's, you can't stereotype every time, you know? <laughs> that's great, thanks, Agla. Um, who else am I looking for? Yeah, Keith. Um, you, you were talking about uh, suitable for the European mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, it is a hidden stereotype world that a lot of parents are very unaware of what's going on. I mean, a lot of parents are unaware of what's going on on Facebook and what is the other one, ask.com or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, have you any plans uh, in the future to try and tackle, highlight uh, cyberbullying? Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny you ask, because I was in a, a pitching session with the boss, the programme director from TV3, Ben Froud, the other day, and, and, I, and I suggested this. I said, cyberbullying, but you see, the, the, the thing with these type of programmes and the thing with news, and I'm sure Shane has discussed this with you before, is that the news values all have to be there. So it has, you know, there has to be timeliness, it has to be of the moment, it has to have an impact, it has to be human interest, conflict, all these different types of things have to be there. Um, so he said, it's interesting, but if you go naked now in three months' time, this story could be old. And um, so what I suggested to him, and I still think it's a good idea, but he doesn't, he isn't too crazy about it, is, is I suggested that we actually track down and doorstep these people. Um, mm. So the, what are they called, trolls? Is that what they're called? Um, the trolls, online yeah. trolls. You know, I wanted to start off with cases of people this had happened to, and um, maybe the parents of those two young girls who'd recently committed suicide as a result of this, um, other stories as well, um, and then actually, find somehow um, the people that were behind it um, and to see their motivations for doing it. So, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting topic, yeah. I mean, the fact that, like, uh, if some kid is being bullied and the stuff put up on certain pages about the kid, mm. it, there's no direct number to ring. Mm. There's no contact f with Facebook whatsoever, like. Yeah. It's, uh, so how to do it? Going on, like. There's always a way. Well, it's the I suppose the irresponsibility, maybe, kind of. Where does the book stop with with something like Facebook? You know, yeah. do you? You know, there, there was a time when it was easy enough to get a website shut down. Facebook is such an international monster now. How would Absolutely. you even begin to tackle to tackle that? I mean, there's been some talk in some of the media uh, about it, it actually being, you know, passing laws or legislation to make it illegal to have a Facebook page 
until you're a certain age, right, for yeah. example, because you got that, that last girl, Lara, was what, 12? That's right. She went into it, she'd had a patient, she was 10 or something, mm, yeah. and you even hear of kids younger than that again. I mean, it's a, it's a dangerous, um, it's a dangerous area. Mm, no, it's a, it's, it's a real minefield, all right. Yeah. Okay, who else? Off here. Yeah, shoot. Off here, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Shane. <laughs> Hello. Oh, up again. Sorry. <laughs> it's a, a, you know, all we see is like a sea of blackness and we hear yeah, voices, yeah. you know. Okay, go ahead. Um, Paul, if you were given the opportunity to make a documentary about anything without ri like the fear of, you know, risking something happening to you or your family, Ooh. what would you like to make? That's a really good question. So I have absolute immunity. I have absolute protection. Nobody can come near me after this. No, no one can put a finger on you. Whoa. No phone calls in the middle of the night. Your, your, your desert island this documentary. This is my desert <laughs> island documentary. Um, geez, do you know what? I don't actually know. Um, I, I tell you, there are, certain, there are certain things. Where are you? Put your hand up. Where are you? Right. Um, there are certain things you simply can't touch whilst the media in Western Europe and in Ireland is obviously a liberal media. Um, there are things that we are straitjacketed on. Um, and uh, for instance, looking into the government, looking into people with vast mm. amounts of power and influence um, is really, 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 really tricky. Thanks very much. Um, <laughs> is, <laughs> Hello. Is, is really, really tricky. So in answer to your question, if I was given, um, if I was given carte blanche and what I do, I would spend a long time looking into the practices of politicians in Ireland. Um, and to actually find out, <laughs> <laughs> and to actually find out, um, and this isn't me just being populist now, but I'm absolutely fascinated um, just by the culture that has been made transparent quite recently, um, insofar as they were just, you know, just the practices were absolutely outrageous. So to, for us to believe, and um, because it's been highlighted in the media that that doesn't happen anymore, it's ridiculous, it's naive, and it's simply not true. Um, so I would love to really spend time. I would love to infiltrate the Doyle. I would love to run for office, almost, just so that I could actually find out what happens in the halls of power. Um, and I would love to spend years doing something like that, actually telling people the truth, because we don't know what goes on in there. Um, you know, I mean, even Enda Kenny at the moment, uh, telling his party that they have to vote in a certain way, um, in the, perhaps, you know, in, in the debate over abortion. I mean, all these kind of things, they're not democratic. Um, there's nothing democratic about them. So in terms of um, how they use public funds, in terms of the machinations of politics, in terms of you know, their definition versus ours of democracy, I'd love to have a look at all of that. You know, I really would. There's a particular way that politics is reported in Ireland, though, isn't there? Even the, 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 the journalists that really seem to want to go for it you can't. hold back. You can't. You know? I mean, you're, you're proposing kind of a Hunter Thompson fear and loathing kind yeah. of a, approach. You know, it would be very interesting to see that apply to the Irish context. Absolutely, hugely interesting, but but you just can't do it. And um, when I said earlier on, I mean, somebody will, somebody will have the guts, the cojones to do it. And um, but if I tried, there's a fellow called David McMunn, who's our solicitor in TV for a lawyer. And every time he sees me come, and he breaks out in a sweat and tries to leave the office, <laughs> um, because obviously the stuff that I give him, he doesn't really like. So I've broached these type of things, knowing they'd bounce back at me. But um, you know, it, at the end of the day, TV companies, except for RTE, um, are commercial enterprises. So. Um, if they think they're going to be sued, then they're just not going to do it. Yeah. Thanks very much. It's a good question. Um, who's next? Um, if you got a chance to interview Larry Murphy, would you do it? And if so, what question would you ask him? <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's funny about that? <laughs> uh, um, I think Larry, Larry Murphy is one of the, uh, Is he here? Do you know what yeah, I mean? Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Give me the mic. I'll ask him now. Larry? Uh, if I... If I got the chance, of course, there's no, there's no journalist worth their salt that wouldn't like sit down with Larry Murphy. Um, I'd say you'd love to have a pick at oh, his brain, definitely, absolutely. Yeah. And do you know what I'd do? Um, I would ask him one very, very, very simple question. Larry, what happened to you? <laughs> Genuinely, you know, what happened? Way back when, the first time that an impulse to uh, sexually abuse or sexually assault a woman, uh, the first time you felt that, what in the months and years leading up to that? Um, happened to you because unless he's one of the very few people that I believe to be that were born evil then there was at some stage not Larry Murphy the rapist not Mar Larry Murphy the accused serial murderer and um, it was Larry Murphy and um, the, the normal bloke and I, I would love to know what happened to him great good question who's next 
Yeah, sure. Yeah. Cool. Another question there for those that didn't hear it, um, of what would be uh, the opinion no, on legalizing yeah, prostitution? Um, it's, it's, it's a very good question, and it's very, very difficult to answer, but I will try in brief. Um, uh, the argument for legalizing prostitution that I came, came across is that it would make it safer for the women involved, uh, that it would take um, the prostitutes themselves um, out of the hands of, of sort of criminal types and pimps, that you would legitimize it, that you would make it all legal. Um, but in terms of legalizing it, I've never really been sure that that would be such a terrific idea. And the reason I believe that is you have to look at the reasons that women get into it in the first place. And this is only speaking from the women that I met and what I experienced. I found that the women in it at the moment, and I spoke to several escorts and prostitutes, people who work both on the street and off the street, and they all said exactly the same thing with a very plastic smile and rehearsed response. They'd all tell me they love what they do, and that they love having sex. They can't believe that they get paid for it. Mm. Um, but then you'll speak to a woman who's out of it and hasn't been, you know, who's left prostitution behind, and what withered remains there are of the person she was when she began uh, will tell you um, how absolutely horrific it is so, um, and what it did to her and how much she hated the men and the men that slept with her and the men that orchestrated the, um, the, the, the business itself because it's generally men. Um, so I think if you were to, it's, it's really the lesser of the evils, there's no right or wrong, but I think if you were to legalize it, then you would be validating it. Um, and I don't think validating prostitution, saying to people, this is okay, believe what they say in the brochures, believe the girls that say they enjoy it, and that's how it would be marketed, I think that's really dangerous. So. Whether it's um, right or wrong, mm. prostitution's been happening since the beginning of time. Yeah. Um, do you not think that it would be, you know, as you're saying, the greater good if it was safer? Yeah. Look, you could be right. You know, I mean, I certainly don't have all the answers here. I looked into this to try and find it, but I, I, I think the evils that are in prostitution, and there are many, I think legalizing it would be an accelerant of that. I think it would make a bad situation worse. At the moment, there are a thousand active prostitutes in Ireland at any one time. That's including women on the streets and women off the streets in apartments. I, I think that if you were to, pro to legalize it, it would, it would mushroom that. Mm. Um, and I suppose it would minimize the suffering because that's what really is, is, is there. Um, in terms of legalizing it, would it stop people being trafficked? I think that's a good question. And I don't think that's the case. Mm. Um, I think people are always going to always going to be trafficked into prostitution, whether it's legal or not, because how are they going to find that out? Someone's going to walk up to a window, knock on the window and say, are you trafficked? I mean, that girl will have been told her family will be killed, she will be killed, if she tells the truth. So, you know, it's a there's real minefield, of, you know. There's plenty of perfectly legal industries that people are trafficked into anyway Absolutely. in Ireland. Yeah. Never mind. I mean, if you're following, I often think of it, you follow the logical train of thought if we're going to legalize prostitution. Are we going to have like a minister for prostitutes? Do you know what I mean? I know that that sounds facetious, but when you follow the train of thought, it, it's, it's problematic. You yeah, know? It yeah, is. It is. It's a good question, though. Very Thanks question, very much. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, great. I have one. Uh, you, you touched on earlier about your desert island one. Yeah. What, what's, what's your view then on whistleblowing as yeah. a way to get this information out? And is there a difference between as a journalist and as a person, or is it the same opinion? So how, how do you mean? Sorry, so Whis whistleblowing, uh, the cable leaks that WikiLeaks release regularly, oh, I see, as, I see, I see. as opposing these, these huge monstrosities that governments have been yeah, hiding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let me think then. I, I can only see that as, as, as a good thing, I think. Yeah. Um, I mean, people absolutely have the right to know these things are going on, and I think it taps into the question from earlier on. I mean, if I was given a Desert Ireland doc, um, you know, could, I would look into the machinations of those type of things. Um, the secret correspondence between governments, the, uh, whether or not there is any truth in the stonemasons really controlling the world from an underground bunker, you know, those kinds of things. I was joking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, those kinds of things. But I would love to look into something like that. So I think um, what that particular gentleman whose name escapes me at the moment, WikiLeaks. Oh, um, yes. Right, man, Lord, 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 Lord. oh yeah, I know the guy. Yeah, 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 I can't but, remember his name either. There you are, Assange. Um, what he's done, I think, is, I think can only be um, a good thing, mm. despite the fact that he did put some people's life um, at risk. I think maybe it was a risk worth taking.
Thank you very much. Um, I think that's about all we have time for, folks. I promised you that you'd get to your buses, but we do have, where's Joan? The raffle? Oh, Deirdre's. Um, there are a lot of ladies looking for photographs with Paula. <laughs> 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 okay, we'll try and accommodate that within reason. <laughs> I'm sure be happy, guy. No problem, no problem, no problem. Okay, where's Joan? Oh, there we go.